All right, there it is. Okay, I see our faces in OBS. That's always a good sign. And there it is on the Twitch side of the world. I can say good morning to you because you're 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 behind me. You're on the, yeah. the West Coast. I'm stuck here in the middle where it's decidedly winter time or winter is coming. I guess maybe the better way to phrase it. So, good morning, Arun. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you, Nate. Yeah, it is indeed a good morning, and it's sunny and it's bright and it's not so cold. Yeah, I get the cold thing going. I think it's 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 in the 30s ish right now, and then, you know, I mean, it, it's fine. We don't have any snow, which is always nice. I'm not a big fan of winter, although I. I saw something uh, this morning that we're only like nine and a half weeks away from the Winter Olympics. And it, it just seems like we just, I mean, we did just have the Summer Olympics. And so it is a little weird that we're already going right into winter. But I guess it's that time of year. You know, what are you going to do? Yeah. What are you going to do? Uh, no. anyway. Hope you had a good Thanksgiving, at least. Oh, I did. I did. Thank you for I, this. This is how the, the time warp of the pandemic works. I already forgot that Thanksgiving was over the weekend. I don't know how I could have forgotten because we, we had leftovers last night. How was your, your Thanksgiving? Did you have a good time? It was very good. Yeah, very good. Uh, met a lot of friends and I don't have uh, much family around here it's a lot of friends met a lot of friends and uh, a lot of food oh, oh yeah I st I'm still in food coma <laughs> well that that's the whole point I think of the Thanksgiving holiday at least, at least that's the way I do it it's all about the food is is there anything in particular I'm always curious to see if people have a specific item that they associate with thanksgiving or that's a must-have is there anything that that you look forward to or? yeah that's one of the you know advantages of being an immigrant that we can pretty much there is no baggage pretty much from that perspective so we experiment with stuff these days my daughter who's in who's a sophomore in college she is uh experimenting with baking so we made a nice. lot of pies and yeah. stuff yeah and then you know um they're a big fan of uh, the British baking show. So oh, yeah. uh, uh, we couldn't find like the only pie cases or the, the crusts that you pre-made pre pie crusts that mm -hmm. you'll find in a store were all gluten free. So oh. we ended up buying a bunch of flour and butter and making it on our own. Nice. <laughs> it turned out pretty good. It okay. was pretty good. Yeah. What, what was your favorite of the pies? So she made uh, chicken pot pie, uh, a savory one. I'm more a oh. fan of savory pies. Okay. So okay. a chicken uh, pot pie, that was my favorite one, yes. Because okay. it, it's, uh, for me, it's pumpkin is, is something I always look forward to for Thanksgiving. And my, my son has not, I guess, discovered the joy of pumpkin quite yet. But so he, he wanted an apple pie. So my wife actually made an apple pie along with an interesting sort of pumpkin concoction and so I guess that just means more pumpkin pie for me, which is fine. Although it's not like I need it, but you know, it's still good. Yeah. Hello, Sharma. How are you? Good to see you. Um. So, all right. Well, let's see. I, I don't want to talk. Well, let's finish up with Thanksgiving. So we we had a very small celebration. We only had a couple of people over. My in laws came over, but we we had all the normal stuff, right? The turkey and and the, the stuffing and everything else. It was it was quite tasty and. We don't make turkey very often, and and so it was a little bit of an experiment for my wife and I. And so I've, I've got, like, the meat probes that I use when I make steaks and things like that, so we threw that in the turkey, except I clearly didn't get one of the probes in quite the right spot because when it mm -hmm. said it was done, I used my other little probe thingy, my little instant read, and I'm like, oh, well, yeah, this part's done, but but not this part over here. So we, we did have a little bit of juggling towards the end there trying to get everything timed out right. But But that's the joy of cooking when you have lots and lots of of things that have to come out of the oven at the same time yeah <laughs> for me it's just the sheer size of turkey and the complexity right. to deal with <laughs> deal with it it's like it sounds like a science project pretty much and i give up i'm like that's too much work not worth it it, it, it kind of is you know it, the, these turkeys are huge and you have to take it out of the freezer days beforehand to let it thaw and then you got to think about seasoning it. And then, I mean, it, it's a whole process. And if, if you're not yeah. sort of thinking ahead and doing the math, you know, you end up in a bad place. But it, it worked out really well. We had, it was my file. Well, I'm glad. Best, I'm best glad. turkey he'd ever had. So oh, I'm, I'm wow. running with it. I'm That's with the it. best compliment from I think so. father in law. I think so. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to take that as, as him being, you know, truthful with us. But anyway, all right. Well, let, let's, let me start with where I always start. Give us your, your origin story. How did you get into this weird world known as technology and, and wind your way up to, to, you know, unfortunately being one of my victims here on a random Monday yeah. morning? Definitely, definitely. Like I, for me, uh, the first interaction with the computer was very early age in the days of Z80s, if you guys remember. It was like those cassette tapes and tapes oh, yeah. like uh, 
30 minutes to load the OS yes. to play a <laughs> simple game, right? So I, I was always very fascinated by technology. For me, this was uh, the career I wanted to do. Uh, I was in love with computers since childhood. I had, I was fortunate. I always had access to computers, even growing up in uh, in India. I we, I mean, I had access to a computer at an early age, and uh, it just grew my love for computers all along. And technology has been kind of a religion. My dad was a very, he was very savvy, technology mm -hmm. savvy, so it kind of rubbed off also. And uh, yeah, I mean, programming kind of became uh, a way to express yourself to kind of just figure out you know it was this endless world where you can just go deeper and deeper and there's no it's a bottomless i mean bottomless pit kind of sounds negative but no right. it, it, it it has a lot to explore right and a lot to learn so uh, yeah and then i came uh, i went to uh, i came here uh, to the united states to do a masters in actually believe it or not in ai back in uh, back in the late 90s and then at that time, the dot-com boom was going on, and it was like, you know, you can spell a computer, you can get a job, right? Like, kind of like, <laughs> kind of like it's now. So, yeah, I kind of, uh, the lure of money kind of uh, lured me to Silicon Valley from Texas. And uh, here I am now, 22 years later, I'm still here. So, it's fun. It's been a fun ride, and it's still going on. I mean, it's amazing that the best years, I feel, are still ahead of us, right? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, the list pace at which we are democratizing the access to building blocks of building things is just fascinating to watch and seeing my kids they don't even know they don't even need to know the components of technology that we knew i mean the same way right. we didn't need to know the read access latency of our hard drive to figure out how to do the right application architectures right. Same way, these kids, they assume there is computing power everywhere and it's right. very easily accessible and very easily, uh, you know, scalable and deployable to whichever way they want, which is right. amazing, which is fascinating. So, yeah, it's, well, that's... It's, it's so amazing to see how technology has changed our approach to so many things. You know, I, simplest one to me is is directions. How do I get from point A to point B? I think nothing of asking my phone how to get from here to there, e even places I know how to get to. Like I took my son to school this morning. I know how to get to my son's school. That's not a mystery to me, but I still ask my phone because I don't know, maybe there's going to be traffic. Maybe I want to take another route. Maybe I miss a turn because there's, you know, some, an accident or something. And I, I want it to be able to reroute me, you know, and, and it, it's interesting to me how that, that, that isn't necessarily universally true. My, we were at one of my son's soccer games and my mother-in-law asked us, where or how to get to some restaurant you know we were kind of on the western side of the cities and and i just kind of said well i don't know just ask your phone and you could see that was a very unsatisfactory answer for her it's like but your your phone will know like your, your phone might even tell you like actually just go straight down this road right in front of us and it'll get you right there i don't know i this is not my part of town so you know but, but, but there is just, a sorry to uh, no no I just, just think of the change of that you know going from you needed an atlas or you needed to just have it all up here to yeah. just ask your phone. But there is a limit to that technology. Like here in, um, in um, South Bay, like we, we, we go to Santa Cruz uh, Beach quite often and mm -hmm. you have to pass through Los Gueras to go to Santa Cruz through uh, on the freeway. And, uh, you know, this, the downtown of Santa Cruz has this huge... Uh, um, you know, board, not not board. It's like um, that orange thing is which uh, you know the the traffic boards or the traffic sign, and it says mm -hmm. Google is wrong. This is not the way to the beach. Please turn back. <laughs> 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 so that was just uh, you know you see the corner case of where technology will go wrong, and uh, and you know people have to make take uh, real world physical actions to sure. say that, hey, Google is not right. But there have been flip cases where I have not trusted Google and regretted it later, so. Right, right. Yeah, so it, I agree it is, with you. It is always interesting when when you, you kind of know how to get someplace and, and you know, your GPS is telling you, no, no, I actually go this way, and you're like, okay. And, and, and you're and like, I've had that conversation with my wife, and I'm like, well, 
the, the app knows things we don't. It has access to traffic data, construction data, things that we're probably not aware of. And, you know, on more than one occasion, I've had it say, hey, I can I can shave five minutes off your trip. Do you want an alternate route? It's like, yes, I do. Thank you very much. And <laughs> yeah, it, it is fascinating. But yeah, you know, you'd think that's the kind of thing that would get fixed fairly quickly, especially in and around, you know, the valley. That's not like somebody at Google has to be aware of that. You know, how have they not fixed that? You know, that you need a big sign saying this is not actually the way. Don't trust your GPS. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh you know, the fact that it is in Silicon Valley, the fact that uh, it is one of the Silicon Valley companies and the fact that everyone is so technology loving and still there are these, uh, it just gives you the taste of like that whole incidence is everything in one incidence that right. you see what can go pro probably go wrong with technology and where we still have to use our common sense sometimes to say, yeah. hey, where is this taking me? Like, this doesn't seem like it's going in the right. mountains, not in the beach, not towards the beach. So, <laughs> well, you know, we've all heard those stories of person drives their car into a lake because their GPS said turn left here. And, and you are right. There has to still be a little bit of that, you know, human has to take over. And, and that's why I think it, you know, you bring up AI and I definitely want to explore that. But I, I, I think it's, it's that interesting issue we have, right? Where, where we sometimes trust it too much. You know, like you, there's plenty of stories of the self-driving cars that are not really self-driving yet, but people think it's close enough. And so they're in the back seat while the car is driving. It's like, you're not supposed to do that yet. You know, we're just not there. You know, and it, and it occurs to me that this is going to be a bumpy ride between where we are now with sort of this pseudo technology that keeps you in the lane and will slow you down if you're getting too close to the car in front of you to, oh, no, the car does drive itself. And actually, you don't have any control over it because the human is actually the problem here. You know, it's it's going to be fascinating to see what that shift looks like and, and how long that's going to take. You know, I think we always sort of, what do we say? We overestimate where we'll be in the next two years and underestimate where we'll be in the next 10. And curious to see what that all looks like. But Yeah, I mean, I think uh, at the end of the day, all these are... I, at least that's my mental model that these are kind of statistical problems, right? Like you are sure. basically trying to estimate the optimal, uh, the optimum or the optimum path or the optimum route or the optimum set of settings that will allow you to drive the, for example, a car. Uh, the problem, at least my experience with AI has been that, it, you know, it's, it's not, there has to be some, uh, decision making that needs to that cannot be trained like that needs sure. to come from the experiences but at least the, the back then when I was doing neural networks you could always overtrain them and then mm. you will always get that specific answer or you undertrain them in which case it doesn't know what to do with uh, you know with the situations and these are regression problems like obviously if you have classification problems it's a different but in the, the regression case and that I feel is just that's the problem. Like you then just have to build so many neural networks, which which will deal with all the cases if you become very specific. But if you make something generic, then it probably may not know how to deal with certain situations. And right. so I think it's a great technology for assistance for human drivers or for humans. And that just don't, doesn't apply to, I think, for everything else. I believe that it is a great assistance, but we cannot lose our human intuition and human uh, and just assign it to an AI and say, you know, become free of that. It can surely automate a lot of things. It can surely right. assist with a lot of mundane things, right? Uh, like parallel but, parking. Yes, uh, like parallel parking or even, uh, I mean, the level, don't get me wrong, I'm not dissing AI. I think the level of AI is just fascinating that right. you can summon your car in a parking lot it will come and show up next to you to get in. Uh, but I think <clears throat> when it comes to safety, it is your responsibility at the end right. of the day, right? So uh, there's always that push and pull. Right? I mean, I just think about all of the edge cases that are involved in driving from point A to point B. You know, I, I my son is, is 14 and we start his driver's ed training over the winter. And and so I've tried every time we're driving somewhere to kind of drop him these little tidbits, these little hints like, hey, you should always expect when you're driving through a neighborhood and you see a couple kids playing on the side, they're going to dart into the street. You should expect that a ball is going to come rolling at you. And so, you know, slow down and just be 
hyper aware of the fact that there's a couple kids over there. You see a kid on a bike, you should expect that they're going to dart in front of you. I don't know how we program all that in. I don't know how we teach all those edge cases. And, and I admittedly am not an expert in AI by even you know remote standards. But it does strike me that there are an awful lot of edge cases involved in driving that we build up over the course of, well, driving, you know, thousands and thousands of miles. And and I realize that's what's going on with some of these these vehicles. But, you know, I'm I'm interested to see what the practical limitations of it are and and how do you deal with some of those scenarios. But my my so I drive I, I have a Tesla which has uh self driving and uh I don't trust it. Uh, whenever I am approaching some area for which I am anxious, I don't mm. trust the AI. I'm like, if sure. I am anxious, obviously, maybe I never tried it, but I feel uh, quite uneasy about trying letting the AI do it. Sure. Right? So that's my barometer, basically. <laughs> well, and so many of the, I guess, existing instances of this have been tested and built in places where the weather conditions are pretty awesome. I live in a place where at least part of the year it's it's not so great and it's snowy and you can't see the lines on the road anymore. And I'm very curious to see how some of these technologies deal with with snow and sleet and ice and all of those other characteristics. Not just uh, snow and sleet, like uh, very frequently, uh, like Tesla system, for example, is based on cameras mm -hmm. and they don't rely on, I think if I'm correct on radar data, they only rely on cameras. Uh, so it's more vision uh, based like what, uh, mimicking like how humans process information sure. and very often when you're driving on the freeway it will say hey this camera is blocked or it is it is getting glare from the sun so i cannot process data from this camera and uh, makes me wonder oh what happens if it is you know if there is a huge floodlight or if there's right. something else on the road and then how does it process that information so it's early stages i mean what they have done is quite fascinating oh absolutely you know, uh, being able to act on real-time vision data and make control, uh, you know, control changes, for example, on the control uh, controls of the car and the controls of the actually just the controls of the car. It's just fascinating, but still, it it is not, I, and I don't expect it to be hundred percent or even eighty percent accurate. Right. Like, so I mean, and that, that's the thing with new technology, right? Like technology is evolving so rapidly mm -hmm. that uh, we have to get out of this uh, or not get out. I think I should not be in preaching mode. It, we have to kind of expect that the first versions of things will not be perfect. It will it'll right. evolve over a time period of time. And that period of time can be years right. of evolution. Uh, uh, and that's the fascinating part because that you know, we as VMware, at least, are trying, or the Tanzu team, the tools that we are building, the things that we are building will allow people to do these experiments much, much faster, much, much uh, quicker, that your uh, evolution can be much faster rather than going through the, uh, going through the pro uh, traditional where it takes years to, you know, things build entropy as they yeah. linger around for a longer period of time. So, you know, if you look at the theory of evolution, it's uh, the more frequent, you know, the more frequent generations, more frequent iterations you can do, it's more frequent, much better outcomes. You can get to optimum outcomes much faster. So I think that applies to software. It is very fascinating that we are getting there, that we can mm -hmm. do these iterations incredibly faster, fast now at such a, such a low cost that it's... Right quite amazing yeah i think that's why i feel that the best days of technology are still ahead of us not behind us so far mm -hmm. we were just trying to capture this hardware <laughs> how to make hardware more efficient more power, less power hungry i think we are almost there uh, with less power hungry at least uh, but uh, now i think the fascinating parts are starting we well, you used a phrase at the beginning that I, I am fond of it, it's in my wheelhouse, and that's the democratization of technology. And I do think that's one of the most interesting shifts I've seen in my career from, you know, when I first started, it was like your operations team said, well, this is what we support. So this is what you have to deploy to. And this is when you can deploy. And now it, it's, it's, in my opinion, anyway, and I get in, I get in arguments with my operations friends around this one. 
it's us saying as an application team, this is what we're building here. You know, now you get to, you know, handle this for us or help us, you know, run this more efficiently. I do think one of the interesting sort of flip sides of this democratization coin is the fact that it makes development teams, makes software engineers, we have to have more accountability too. And, and mm. a lot of the things that we shifted to our operators in the past around how to do this typically cost efficiently, you know, that that's now on us. You know, it's so easy to just turn something on, not realize it until you get your bill and you're like, whoa, what are we spending all this money on? You know, I mean, I just, what are your thoughts around that? I, you know, I don't know what I'm trying to ask here, but I'm just curious for, for your insight. No, definitely. I think I'm getting the gist of the question. And uh, I'll give you, I mean, I have thought a lot about this um, as I've been working on uh, this, uh, uh, since I started working on Tanju last year. Like, I think, uh, you know, if you go back into the history of computers and enterprise software, right, uh, the, the field of middleware has been dominated by one or two companies like uh, um, WebLogic, Oracle WebLogic, IBM, uh, IBM's WebSphere, and a few other. And what that middleware was, you know, databases, message queues, and, uh, you know, patterns to communicate with various pieces of software, uh, patterns to expose software outside, uh, or to expose the web services or the services outside the, uh, the little thing that you're building. And those things, right? Like basically those software components that allow you to make your software usable. And, you know, that's why it was called middleware. Now, if yeah. you fast forward today, you have incredible amount of that, that whole middleware thing has exploded, right? Like in the database layer, we have hundreds of choices. Yeah. In the message queue space, we have hundreds of choices. In, uh, you know, load balancers, we have hundreds of choices. You don't even imagine 20, 15 years ago, if you wanted to create a new load balancer, you had to file a ticket to the application load balancing team who will set up right. a route in the, in, you know, an F5 or in, you know, any other uh, load balancers and, you know, it'll take days. Yeah, if you're lucky, it'll now, take days. <laughs> yes, now you can just, uh, you know, your Kubernetes cluster comes with a load balancer kind of mm -hmm. auto-deployed and, you know, giving us all the networking mumbo jumbo set up from end to end. Right. So uh, uh, my point is now you have incredible amount of choice. Right. Right. But, uh, you know, quoting Spider-Man with choice or great power comes great responsibility. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> so choice also a line I'm very fond of. <laughs> a choice gives you a lot of power. This choice gives a developer. Yeah. You can expose your enterprise assets by a click of a button. And then you have to put, so who is responsible? Right. I think right. so. We have to put the right guardrails. So it's not wrong to have uh, opinionated stack that you deploy because you know how to maintain it, you know how to measure it, you know how to secure it. What is going away, I think, is the paradigms of walled gardens that we used to create for enterprise uh, software, right? Sure. Uh, that everything is in this. I have my... Uh, and, and I keep bringing it back to history because we have seen this in history, right? Like the um, castles and the, the, these walled gardens that were created to keep humans secure were became uh, obsolete because the weapons or the way <clears throat> things people used to hit them with, with got better, right? The same right. thing was, is happening in software today that enterprise software was all about walled gardens. You know, everything is running in my walled garden and, you know, then I can control access to who can come in and come out. That's not the case anymore because with cloud, with the need for capacity, with the need for you know, elasticity of capacity, it's much more easier to for one person to screw up. And yeah. we have seen that. Uh, you know, if you look at the some of the incidences we have had in last five years, the Verizon incidents, the Capital One incidents, right? All of them is a misconfigured cloud database, right? Which could happen with one developer. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we need to then figure out how to control. And uh, that, what you were asking, I think is relates to that. Yes, developers have that power, but I think operations team now has the responsibility of figuring out what uh, opinionated stack should we ask yeah. our developers to use? Can we have choice of stacks that we give our developers that they can use so they, it meets all their needs, but it doesn't impede their speed or their need to uh, experiment rapidly. 
So I I think I think there's an opportunity for both. Right, yeah. developers can experiment with a lot of technologies, but when it comes to production systems where you're protecting uh, liability of a company, you're protecting uh, the crown jewels of the company, you're protecting important consumer and customer data for a company, it's still the responsibility of the security team, the, uh, the operations team, and the other uh, various aspects of uh, a company that need to provide that. Yeah, and I, I, like one of the messages that I try to get across, <clears throat> especially in terms of kind of the microservices distributed architectures world, <clears throat> with that autonomy comes accountability. And, and I, I love that concept of the opinionated stack because the, the danger we run into, in my opinion, if I put on my architect hat, is this paradox of choice. You know, I remember in my previous uh, role, my previous company, as we were bringing cloud in, that was one of our big stumbling blocks was there's all this new technology, all these new options. And while we can handhold the first five, six, 10 teams, we can't do that for every single team. So how do we open up the floodgates, but let people do it safely? You know, the, the guardrails, the guideposts, whatever you want to call it. And, and I think that's where a, a sort of collaboration has to happen between apps and ops to say, okay, what do we, what do we need to do? What do we need to provide? How do we, how do we do that safely? Here are the paved roads that we're going to do because the paradox of choice is in many ways worse than the one size fits all kind of yes, approach to software. Exactly. Yeah. But you are absolutely correct. Like I, I would like to uh, build on top of that, that this idea of having paved roads is very important. And I think that's what we need to provide. Like uh, if you think about software supply chain so far, um, you know, when in the middleware world, the software supply chain was very limited. Only few people were pro producing software. Those were trusted vendors and you knew what you were getting. Today, in the land of microservices and distributed architectures, you can choose software from an open source system. You can choose software from a closed source system. You can combine anything. You know, if you look at how Node, if you're using Node, you can basically pull any library and you don't even know who wrote that library, right. what kind of hooks are in that library or whatnot. And it's part of your enterprise software stack, right? Like, so providing that, uh, those paved roads, providing assurances, providing uh, some semblance of security, like what you are getting and where it came from, what is the provenance and what is the update? It, and it may be the great, they, maybe there's no vulnerability in the software, but the pace at which things are changing. The library that some SSL library that that library is using might have some new vulnerability, right. right? That it needs to be, I think there is a lot of work for uh, operations and other teams that it's uh, it's going to be a new, new work, but it, I think it's going to be a lot of work that needs to be figured out. Yeah, and it, it's these coarser abstractions. This is a, another thing that, that I was thinking about as we, you know, kind of your, as you first sort of talked about, remember we used to load these off of audio tape. You know, I think that's, it's always fun to me to show my son something from the paleolithic era of technology <laughs> and just sort of see his mind kind of go, what is that? You know, and I've, I've thought a lot about that, that, you know, a teenager today kind of thinks of a computer as, as, you know, these, these little slabs of glass we all carry with mm -hmm. us everywhere we go. And, and it's been really, it's another big shift I've seen in my career is we've gone from these very low level pieces that we had to stitch together to, well, no, I, I've got building blocks now and they're getting coarser and coarser. And I, I think that's good because it allows us to focus more on solving business problems, figuring out what it is that, that we can do to make our, our business folks more competitive or whatever it is we're trying to solve. You know, and, and so I think that's part of it too, is us building these these lego pieces that we can snap together so we're not all reinventing you know we're not we're not writing mm -hmm. compilers we're not writing operating systems yeah. you know and, and so i think that's another interesting part of this shift yeah absolutely i think and that is what i say is fascinating that we have given we pretty much have a choice for every aspect of software uh, stack today for most applications yeah i mean and you have building blocks if you want to build something custom. Like if the queues right. that Kafka or the message queues, you know, that the cloud provides or one of the, you know, if you're using Kafka or something else or RabbitMQ or whatever, th that is not meeting your need. You can write your own, like all the <laughs> components are there, right? You don't have to 
now go about, oh, what would be my persistence layer and how do I figure out? No, you, you can push a button and have a persistence layer. It's just about right. how you do the queuing, right? Like, uh, oh, I don't know how to choose the, you know, the master election if I'm doing a cluster. No, there are technologies that exist and, you, uh, you know, Kubernetes is doing it, blockchain is doing it. Everyone is solving the same, hey, how do I do elect a leader if in case of failure? And so I think... So many patterns exist, so many uh, paradigms are evolving that it's a fascinating time to write software. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. I think we are, it's bliss, pure bliss right now to, <laughs> to write we, software. We, we certainly get to look at some more interesting problems. I, I agree with you on that part. There's no getting around that. You know, in, in other ways, our lives have gotten more complicated. The demands of of us never seem to slow down and and the the supply never catches up either it, it, it's it's not a bad place to be i guess from an employability standpoint you know the the other thing that that i think about in this space you know i mean i'm i'm ultimately a teacher that's basically what i do for a living how do we teach people this has already been solved you don't you don't need to reinvent that wheel or or to help people know this is when it makes sense for you to build your own or roll your own because you do have this custom. I mean, that's something I've had to fight against as an architect for most of my career is how do you make sure people are aware that, no, actually, you, you don't need that. That's that's built into Spring. You don't need that. That's that's built into Kubernetes. You don't need that. It's already here. You know, and I see that in many ways as an education problem. You know, so what what can we do to sort of make developers aware of what their options are. And this is in your toolkit now. And yeah, maybe 10 yeah. years ago, we had to do it this way, but now we don't. And and here's how to move forward. So I think uh, uh, in my opinion, like standing on the shoulders of giants have always been the right approach to build, uh, uh, you know, building on top of what others have built, right? Like uh, uh, I'll give you a movie reference, right? Like. Uh, goodwill hunting right where he says uh, just write just copy the first paragraph and then start typing and then you will start figuring out i think in software it's kind of similar that you use so uh, you use the software that already exists or you build on top of that that has already been built now that is definitely an education challenge the, it is an education challenge with today because there is just so much information it's right. i get confused if i want to learn about some something let's say i want to learn about uh, how to do an event based architecture you go where will you start looking like you go on google you go on o'reilly you go on you know uh, whatever tools you have available coursera you udacity like there's so many things and then there's so many paradigms and there's so much information so yes the explosion of information is causing such a challenge that you, you, you separating wheat from chef is very yeah. difficult for a developer. But I think that's where the role of architects really comes in. They need to be more uh, prescriptive, more, uh, uh, more, uh, almost more teacher-like, like as you mm -hmm. said, almost more uh, pedantic kind of like, hey, this is how we should do this because this is already solved. But the challenge is a lot of architects that we have today have their ways kind of set in right. the previous generation, right? So right. they still are coming with a fixed mindset that this is how we should do these things and this is how we've always done these things. Yes. And one of the things I struggle as an engineering leader is the not invented here syndrome. Yes. Right? Like, Right? It's like, hey, we need to build this. No, why do we need to build this? This already exists, right? No, no, but it is costly. No, you know, we are not, you know, you have to understand the tangible and intangible costs of building a software system, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have to understand it's not just building, then you have to run it, then you have to operate it, then you have yes. to scale it, then you have to distribute you maintain it, maintain it, have to, fix it. Exactly, and, and update it constantly. And it's not just the tangible cost of building it. Right. Uh, so I think it's, unfortunately, I don't have an answer. I struggle with it as an yeah. uh, engineering leader as well. And I think it's uh, the technology religion has to be propagated to every person. And the only way to kind of uh, handle this is to make mistakes and learn and make mistakes and learn and make mistakes and learn and you know, keep growing that way. 
and hopefully you will find good leaders and good uh, architects who will help you guide on the right path or you might make a mistake and you realize oh that didn't work and then remember that like a lot of times i have made a mistake where i've made a mistake in the past and I, it didn't persist mm. uh, and then i make the same mistake again i'm like oh shit why that was the last <laughs> didn't i learn from the last time <laughs> so so yeah there's no clear answer for that it's yeah. hope, it, hopefully a collection of these things that you work with the right team the right uh, architects the right managers the right mindset and you will figure it out but uh, one thing i would say for people is don't be afraid of making mistakes you know right. these the cost is really to you both personally from a time perspective from a computing resources perspective from money perspective is so low these days for experimenting that is you know try to experiment as many ways you can and you'll figure it out like most people figure it out yeah that's that's so many good points i i i've run into that not invented here throughout my career i mean, i've seen people build their own cloud platforms i've seen people build their own app frameworks and it's like folks this already exists and and i a friend of mine his sort of way of phrasing it is meta work is more interesting than work and so when you've got someone who's faced with well i can put this field on this page you know for the nine millionth time or or i can build a cloud framework you know they want to go run and build a framework instead because that's more interesting work you know, so I think that's part of it too, you know, is we have to get people to understand that you, you don't actually need to reinvent that wheel um, while also being very aware of, you know, I, I loved when you said architects, we tend to be stuck in, well, this is how we've always done it. It's like they say, you know, generals are used to the last war, the one they fought in, and that may not actually have anything to do with the war they're currently in. And I think it's the same for us as we progress. We have to remember, okay, well, there's different kinds of problems today than what we had to deal with in the past. You know, I, I worked on one system for many years that that system was available 10, 12 hours a day because that's all I needed it to be. I didn't need it to be available on the weekends. That's not the case for very many systems these days. You know, and if you still go into it with exactly. this sort of five by 12 mindset, like, eh, that's, that's not going to work so well for a whole bunch of applications. But So I think uh, I was just thinking about this while you were talking. There are two uh, things that stand out for me today. When I look at engineers, when I'm looking to hire people, Right, people who are not set in that this is my circle of competence and I'll only operate within this circle of competence because there is what is your circle of competence today will be obsolete tomorrow, right? Like it'll go away yep. like that, right? Like, and yep. then you'll be just sitting there, oh, what do I do with my circle of competence, right? Like, so you have to be constantly changing your circle of or constantly be mindful that you know you don't really have a circle of competence, you have a transitory circle of competence today. <laughs> But <laughs> it, 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 there are many more dimensions to competence these days than just a two-dimensional or three-dimensional space, right? So uh, you, you really don't have a circle of competence. You have to constantly uh, evolve yourself in learning new technologies, being aware of what's going on. And that's, to me, that's a huge positive signal if I see someone who's trying to do that, who's trying to struggle and always be learning. And the second thing uh, that I see is... Uh, there's a certain amount of humility in people who yes. understand this, right? That, hey, I don't know. You know, they are not afraid of saying, I don't know. I really don't know how this works. But, you know, they they don't say this, but the next thing that they are saying in the in their mind is, you bet in a week, I'll come back and tell you how it works, right? Like, yep. so you can see that in their eyes. You can see that in their body language. And I think that is the most important part is having that growth mindset where we call about call right like that. I don't know, but I'll figure it out. I believe right. in my ability to figure it out. And that I think is the best ability to develop or to nurture as you're growing as an engineer uh, uh, in today's changing technological world. Oh, that's, that's an excellent point. One of my very first managers when she was younger worked at, at Disney and she said there were two rules when you were in the park as an, as, as I guess they call them a cast member. One, you, you can't point with your index finger because that's rude. You got to point with your whole hand. So if someone says, where's the restroom? You know, you point with your whole hand. The other thing is you're not supposed to say, I don't know. It's let me find out for you. And I've always felt that's part of my job as an architect. You know, if you come to me and like, hey, how do we configure this thing? I'm like, 
let's find out, let's figure it out. And, and I think that's part of it is having that sort of innate curiosity and, and, and again, that humility to not just try to fake your way through it and make it up. Like, you know, I don't know, but, but I know how to find out. And then you know, we'll work on it together and we'll solve that problem. That, yeah, that, that is this, it, it, it applies to so many aspects of life. It's mm-hmm. uh, just amazing. So. So let, let me circle back to this AI thing because it, AI is showing up everywhere in marketing now. And I find that fascinating. I, I, I am a golfer, which means for about five months out of the year, this state is not a fun one for me to live in. I don't get to play 365 like, like some other friends, friends of mine do. So Callaway manufactures golf clubs and, and the last couple iterations of their driver, they've been bragging about how it's invented or with AI and they use AI and, and a little bit of it's marketing, a little bit of it is, well, actually they're, they're doing thousands of iterations on, on the backside of the face, putting different wave patterns on there to distribute the weight and give you a better coefficient of something or another. I don't know. I'm not, a, I, I don't know how any of that works. I just, you know, pay for the club and go hit it. <laughs> how much of what we're seeing with AI today, do you think is just a little bit of marketing sprinkled on top versus no, that this is actually changing things in a way that could not have happened five, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Oh, that's such a big topic. Uh, <laughs> frankly, I mean, I feel it's the combination of both, right? Like sure. there is, uh, there is some success, right? Like, uh, I think one, there are areas in which AI, and my knowledge of AI, frankly, is dated. Like, um, they, 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 in 20 years, AI has changed so much. Like, yeah. they have no, so many new neural net models and all that stuff. You know, I didn't, I was, first time I read about uh, convolution neural networks, which basically use this stage-wise thing to recognize an image. My mind was blown away. I thought, I wish I had this 20 years ago. Like, right. this is just fascinating right like so um uh, there is a lot of positive things that are coming out of ai like um, yeah. for example radiology the field of radiology is completely getting transformed by ai right you still need the final confirmation from a radiologist with, for your imaging to find let's say a tumor or something but today's ai is able to figure out fig, uh, you know point pinpoint uh, dot of cancer in a tissue with fairly high accuracy, uh, fairly high rate of predictability. Now, it's still early stages, right? So right. It's, it's not going to replace a radiologist or the job of a radiologist is not going away. But that is an area where it is making a huge impact on human, on human uh, well-being, right? Now, that you know, if you if you abstract that out, then what AI is trying to do is to find much better optimums, right? That can be produced because you can't really run that many experiments. So if you have to, let's say, build a golf course and your variables, uh, sorry, not a golf course, a golf club, and your variables are wind speed and the temperature and the altitude and, you know, all those things, you can't really create, you know, you can't create a wind tunnel for all those experimental right. variables. AI can actually help you uh, vary those, you know, you can say these are my dependent variables or these are my independent variables and what is the optimum value for my dependent variable that I can find. And that's where AI shines. I think it can help you find those parameters. And, you know, one of the problems that I solved when I used to do AI is that these lubricating oils that these uh, companies, for example, the lubrication oil in your car, Today, they have a certain amount of life and it's very difficult to predict the life because the mine from which the oil comes, the mineral composition of that oil. And so we wrote a neural network program to predict that oil life with fairly like 80% accuracy. And that worked very well for the oil company because they don't have to run, if the life is 5,000 hours, they don't have to experiment for 5,000 hours before they can release that product in the market, right? So those problems, I think AI is very good at solving and it will solve and it will help you. And of course, you know, when you're solving these important problems, when it's the buzzword of the day, marketing will put its sprinkle on the top. That's what makes it attractive. But I think it is real. There are some real things, real problems that AI is solving, uh, real problems. But 
it's it's really a question of how it is set up like who's solving it and how they are solving it and what is the uh, outcome of it is it resulting in a better outcome or is it just hey just release it and we'll see right so right. for example you know if i figure out what golf course uh, you, so so what i'm saying is let me take a step back is the governance is not there right how do i know if a golf company is um, promising this is a better golf club it, it it indeed is a golf club because there's no feedback mechanism and ai only works better if you give it feedback on right. whether it predicted the right thing or it came up with the right thing or not so well i don't the, know if i answered your question the, but the other thing that's so fascinating to me about some of these ai applications i've seen is they will do things that humans wouldn't and and, and so this, this golf club is a, a perfect example of that you know the engineers probably would have gotten there eventually but the ai is willing to just experiment with things that he's like well that's weird we'd never do that and then they're like wow that that actually works really well we're not entirely sure why but this weird little ripple that it puts out here on the toe does x y and z and you know a human may not have tried that because it doesn't quite match their expectations i i saw something similar with with i think it was like antenna design for for space applications where AIs came up with these really fascinating kinds of bends and curves that, again, a human would have been unlikely to have produced because, well, we're used to things being in an arc or things having 90 degree angles or yeah. whatever, you know, our preconceived notions of what it's supposed to look like. And the AI doesn't have any of that and produces things that are, well, yep, it hit all our markers. Of course, that yeah. works in situations, situations where what I want you to improve, improve ball speed, improve, uh, you know, coverage of this band of uh, frequency or whatever. A little harder maybe for, for some of these other applications we're talking about, like, hey, get me from point A to point B without you know killing me along the way. I think as humans, we have become very good at, over our course of our history, become very good at uh, doing the cost benefit analysis in our heads and limiting our choices to yeah. low cost things, yeah. right? Like, so we will not do things which seem outlandish to us, whether from a cost perspective or from just thinking perspective, like from a brain cell perspective. And uh, it becomes challenging because you can't really possibly do all those experiments, right? Mm -hmm. For AI, it's like just uh, setting up different set of bits, right? And doing it. So first of all, AI doesn't suffer from those cognitive biases that we have because right. we have evolved that way. That's what has made us human. That's how we became who we became today. And second thing is, the iterations are cheap. So AI yes. can iterate through a lot more possibilities than a human can possibly think of doing it in its brain. So it's, it's pretty powerful. But I don't think that is, uh, you know, that is a power of AI. I just think that's the power of computing and yeah. the cheap storage that is available to attach to that and the ability to unleash this power of computing on these mm -hmm. massive data sets which are cheap to store and process right a linear regression produces most of the results that you need which is not ai it's just a statistical model sure. and it can solve a lot of these problems you take your variables and you figure it out like you know it'll give you a linear function which will be fairly accurate uh, so i feel that uh, we give a lot of uh, you know the ability to run these models is more a, fun a function of cloud computing, of mm -hmm. uh, distributed computing, distributed storage, you know, solid state storage, a bunch of these underlying technologies which have enabled this revolution right now. Yeah, it gets us back to that democratization of technology. You know, the things that we're exactly. able to do today that, I mean, I've, I've thought a lot about this with microservices. You know, you could have had the concept of a microservice 20 years ago. It's just when you went to your operators and said, listen, I want to spin up, oh, I don't know, uh, 1,200 instances of the app server in each environment, you know, they would have never spoken to you again. You know, so it, it's just now that's actually something we can do, you know, thanks to these, you, these different building blocks. You, you know, I think, so I thought a little bit about this. The biggest uh, thing is that in the past, right, like when, when you had to deploy different services, you needed separate network interfaces for each. You needed a way to get to those networks. You needed a way to set up discovery. So you need DNS, you need uh, IP addresses, you need IP space, you need a bunch of networking technologies to figure out how to deploy 
microservices. So that's why you know making a function call was easier for a developer mm -hmm. than making an RPC call or making a network call, right? Yep. What uh, Kubernetes and what a lot of these technologies have done is you don't need to go anywhere. You set up a cluster and it has these fundamental pieces, like it has the service discovery, it has the uh, routing capability. It gives you the address space for each service. It automatically creates an address space. That is what makes it easier for a developer to say, hey, now I can break it into services and I, all I need to do is just make a service call. And yep. someone magically will figure out how to reach that service, yep. how to scale that service, how to do various things. So I think that's what is causing, again, the adoption of this microservices. But as we have discovered, and I think a lot of teams discover, it doesn't come for free. Right? No. Like it, <laughs> one of the biggest challenges- There's no free is, lunches in software. <laughs> one of the biggest challenges is that developers become very uh, focused on their services. Yeah. So then you have silos in your team where people know about their service extremely well. And very few people have the whole abstract understanding of how this application is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an engineering leadership challenge then because you need to do that. You need to make sure that people know. So you have to create rotation programs. You have to say people are not just wedded to one particular service mm -hmm. in the microservices platform. They need to, everyone needs to understand the whole application architecture, how it works, how the events propagate, what happens if some event propagation fails? What is the, <laughs> it's, it's a new set of challenges for yep. a new architecture, basically. Yeah, I mean, that, that's an excellent point. You know, there, there's, there's trade-offs with all these things. I mean, this is one of my soapboxes is trying to get people to understand that there's trade-offs and you do get a lot of power and flexibility when we do these distributed architectures, but there's a heavier load in other places too. It's a lot harder to reason about these systems. You know, ooh, new customer signed up. What happens when a new customer signs up? Well, we don't necessarily know every single instance of that. You know, it's, it's challenging sometimes to, to route through that. You know, so it's, it's, trying to get people to understand much like with these different building blocks, what are those trade-offs? When do you apply them? You know, so that folks aren't reinventing that wheel and building things they don't need to build. And like, no, you've already got a building block for that. Just take advantage of that and, and leverage that. But uh, you know, that's the, the joy of this. It's what help, keeps us employed, I guess, right Arun? Yes, yes, very much so. Gainfully employed and, and more and more employment opportunities are opening up because of that. <laughs> let, let me throw a few lightning round questions at you here as we wrap up, because uh, I yes. we, we, we've had a lot of fun talking about AI, but I got I got to lighten it up a little bit with with some other things, some non techy things. Uh, so what what uh, coffee, espresso or tea when it comes to caffeine espresso. consumption? Espre oh, man, after my own heart right there. Uh, pie or cake? Depends. Depends. Good answer. Good answer. Ooh, th this is one I, I'm always fascinated by. Oceans or mountains? mountains. You have access to both. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. My my son wants to trade Colorado some of our lakes for some of their teeners. I don't I don't haven't figured out how to make that happen. We have a lot of lakes, but we don't we don't have any mountains. Mountains you can walk and ski. Both oceans there is. It's true. You can swim in it. I, I don't like getting wet. I don't like getting wet. <laughs> totally fair. Uh, food trucks or Michelin star restaurant? Where are we going to dinner? Both. Oh, I like that. I like that. Me too. I'm, I'm a I'm a fan of both. You know, it just depends on my mood. Uh, Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings? Oh, Lord of the Rings. Okay, excellent. Action comedy or drama? Action comedy any day. Okay. I'm a geek. Like drama doesn't compute. You, you know, during the pandemic, I have I've had far less taste for drama. We we were watching something, catching up on something that's that's in that drama thing, and I'm like, oh, good, we invented yet another tragedy. Like. Really, these people are finally getting their lives back together, and then now that happens. Like, oh, cool! Thanks for that. Um, is there anything you've been streaming during the pandemic? I, I have. I'm, I think I'm obligated to bring up Ted Lasso at least once during every one of my episodes. Now, is, is, is there anything you've been <laughs> I streaming? Did, I, so when I bought uh, I, my you, my phone is still iPhone 11. When I bought this one, I got a year of Apple TV Plus free, and then that got extended to 15 months, and mm -hmm. so. I watched Ted Lasso. I really Excellent. liked it, and yeah, uh, yeah it's pretty pretty cool. But um, I'm not a big fan of watching TV. I generally sure. don't 
watch much TV. Mostly it's to keep my relationships happy. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I like reading a lot. So I read a lot. I read a book a week or two weeks. Wow. I'll finish the book. So I, and a lot of books, what I have realized is uh, I would be reading and then I'll forget about them. So I'm rereading a lot of books <laughs> in the library, <laughs> in the books that have stuck with me and I have forgotten sure. what they were about. So I read, uh, you know, this Carol Dweck's book. What is this? Uh, <laughs> So I'm reading this, The Mindset again, right? This oh. is a very good book. I think cool. it's, uh, it's talks about the, uh, I think uh, Satya Nadella mentions this in one of his talks. It's a um, growth mindset versus fixed mindset and how nice. to conquer both. So I read a lot. It's fun reading. It's That's my uh, way of entertaining myself. Re reading is pretty amazing when you think about it that, you know, I, I saw this, I guess I must have seen this on Twitter. Somebody made a comment about, you know, anytime I feel bad about buying another book, I realize that I just bought a year of someone's life for fifteen ninety nine. you know, and, and it, it is pretty remarkable that you can be transported if you're in the fiction into these, these amazing worlds and you can learn some just mind blowing things. Uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's pretty, pretty amazing. You know, I mean, I got a lot of books behind me. Got, got a lot of books on my my uh, my my tablet here in front the of me too. Reading so. list. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. They, my friend of mine, Raju, gave me a, a new series to get into, and I'm I'm cursing him because it, it's a lot of books, and they're all well, not all, but most of them are like five six hundred pages at a crack. And I'm like, you you've uh, signed he, me up. What's that? I'm saying there's a, there are a lot of interesting podcasts that are coming up, like Ficonomics yeah, Radio and that yeah. whole uh, thing. They have some very pretty fascinating podcasts. I think that you can listen to and. There's one in that one uh, called People I Mostly Admire, in which they talk about uh, books and people. And nice. That, that one is pretty, you know, it's, it's like a small dose, 30 minute podcast if sure. you listen on like higher speeds. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. Like, we're, we're in like this golden age of time. content. Yes. Actually, so that's what I was reading somewhere that the next generation is going to be of content creators. And we have sure. technologists have made it so easy for these content right. creators to be right. democratized. And now mm -hmm. the next stage is going to be of content creators. Well, I, I was I was thinking about that this morning, ironically enough, as I was driving my son to school. Uh, before, when you did a commute, you listened to a local top 40 radio station or maybe, you know, national public radio, whatever your local public radio was, something like that. You You had one of... A couple of dozen radio stations you could listen to and now you you have basically every song that's ever been created is on your phone and you have limitless hours of whatever topic Access. you want it's it's so amazing a month, right? <laughs> yeah it's 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 just it's mind-blowing to me and then and i'm incredibly fascinated by that anyhow okay well, next, i know next slide yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I know that you have a hard stop, so I, I, I need to wrap up. I do appreciate your time. Thank you very much. This you've covered here, a here. lot of fascinating ground with me today. I appreciate that, my friend. Thank you. Definitely. Definitely. And hey, keep in touch. Then, Absolutely. Uh, uh, I look forward to chatting with you uh, off also. It was very fascinating. It was quite interesting, actually. And I thoroughly enjoyed this one hour. I don't even know where it went. So good. That's that's what you know. It's working right. That I'm doing yeah, my it's job. It's like flying over can... the dateline. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We just lost an hour. We don't know where it went, but but it's recorded, so we can find it later. Uh, fascinating, absolutely wonderful. Right, well, Thanks, Nate. And thank you, have my a friend. Good day. You too. Enjoy. We'll be back in a, two or three weeks, I think, with uh, with another VMware colleague. We've got Glenn Renfro is going to be with. We're going to talk some spring and and bless his heart. He's going to join me, and we'll see what kind of trouble that gets us in. Uh, we'll be back in a few weeks. So thank you again. Thanks, Nate. Have a good one. Bye.